In October of 1960, just a few years before I was born, America was introduced to the small, sleepy North Carolina town. Any hints? Any guesses? Mayberry. Sarah Winder wins the day. In October of 1960, America was introduced to Mayberry, North Carolina, and to a cast of characters, including Sheriff Andy Taylor, Opie Taylor, Aunt B, Barney Fife, my favorite, Otis. <laughs> and the first episode titled, The New Housekeeper, the Taylor's housekeeper and nanny Rose gets married and leaves Mayberry and an opening in the Taylor household. And so Andy believes the best thing is for him to bring his Aunt B to town to live with them so that she can be the housekeeper and nanny to Opie. But Opie doesn't want Aunt B to come live with them. In fact, in one scene, Opie's trying to make breakfast and he boils eggs for 45 minutes and burns all the toast. He only wants Rose back. Nothing Aunt B does is good enough. Opie has no intention of even opening his heart just a little to her, to love her even like his father does. Opie doesn't want her around. And halfway through the episode, Andy finds Opie pondering something very seriously in his bedroom, and the following is their exchange. Opie asks Andy, can I run away from home? Andy responds, you want to run away from home? Well, now, if that's what you've got on your mind, well, you're going about it all wrong. Opie asks, I am? And he responds, oh yeah, you ain't supposed to ask for Paul. Opie says, but you always said I should never go any place far without getting your permission. And he says, well yeah, I know I did say that, but see, running away is a little special. See, what you do in a case like that is first you write a note saying that you're running away, and then you do it. Opie asks, you mean to tell me that's all there is to it? And he says, that's all. Opie looks at him and says, but I don't know how to write. And Andy responds, that does make a problem. Andy offers to write the note for Opie to help him with his plan during the process. And while they're writing the note, Opie realizes that running away from Aunt B is also running away from Andy and not seeing him anymore. Therefore, Opie gets upset and he calls off his runaway plan. Of course, for most of us who have watched a lot of other episodes, we know that Opie falls in love with Aunt B and that she is cemented in Mayberry and stays until he grows up. We jump forward 30 years to my generation. At Christmas 1990, we met Kevin McAllister in the Home Alone movies. Home Alone has become part of family traditions. I know it is in my family. Every Christmas since. Kevin McAllister is roughly around the age of Opie Taylor, but Kevin doesn't consider running away. Instead, his extended family, and if someone figures out how his parents are so rich, let me know. His whole extended family is supposed to take a Christmas vacation in Paris. And the night before the flight, Kevin gets into trouble and his mother makes him sleep in the attic. And before she leaves the attic, Kevin says to her that he wishes his family would disappear. The next morning, he awakens to an empty house and it seems like he got his wish. Somehow, everyone in that massive family forgot Kevin in their rush to get to the airport. 
It's okay during mid-flight when Kevin's mother realizes that her son is missing and you get that great moment where she leans up in the airplane seat and yells his name. And throughout the movie, while she's trying to get back to Chicago to him, Kevin obviously is having quite an adventure. In all of my reading of Luke chapter 2, I can't decide if Jesus at 12 years old is more like Opie Taylor or Kevin McAllister. This morning's narrative of the second visit of the young Jesus to the temple serves as a transition from Luke's gospel infancy narrative to Luke's gospel of Jesus doing his thing. Jesus ministering, healing, teaching, preaching. This serves as the bridge. The Holy Family's first trip to the temple together comes earlier in chapter 2, when Mary and Joseph take Jesus to be circumcised and presented in the temple eight days after his birth. And during that visit, they encounter Simeon and Anna, who give prophecies about this baby boy. They've been waiting for him to arrive. Now, every year, his parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of the Passover, and when he was 12 years old, they went up as usual for the festival. As Jimmy told the kids, this is an every year thing. The family makes their journey to Jerusalem from Nazareth. This would take a couple of days by foot. And Passover is the commemoration of Jewish liberation from slavery, the Exodus story. It's observed with dietary instruction as well as instruction in the temple. The scripture tells us, when the festival was ended and they started to return, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but his parents did not know it. Assuming that he was in the group of travelers, they went a day's journey. Then they started to look for him among their relatives and friends. The scripture is clear that Jesus stays behind. It's not clear to us how he does it. And that's why I say, I wonder if Jesus is at 12, like Opie Taylor, or if he is like Kevin McAllister from Home Alone. Did Jesus start out pretending that he was going back with the family? Did his parents see him in the crowd of family members at one point? But did he have a plan to separate himself and to stay behind? He didn't write a note letting them know, but was this a plan? Or, was Jesus never in the crowd in the first place, and in the rush to get home, did Mary and Joseph think that he was with them or of other family members? If you're from a large family, you understand this kind of thinking. I don't have my kid, but my, my grandmother might, my sister probably does. So what happens in our family. And so did they think that he was with someone else until they got mid-journey when Mary had that realization and screamed out Jesus' name, but he's not there. And did he realize that his family was gone? And so he just went to the temple because that's where he thought he should go. Imagine their fear when they can't find him. Most parents I know, as Jenny pointed out, have experienced it at least momentarily while in public for a few moments when they lose sight of their children. But my mother used to tell us, if someone takes you, they will return you. Whatever that means. <laughs> so this fear that Mary and Joseph felt, and compound that with the fact that they have been told for a long time now, he's 12 now, so for the last almost 13 years, They've been told how special he is, that this child is the greatest human being that anyone will know to be born, that he is the one that will help all of Israel. Angels announced his birth. Do you want to be the parents who are responsible for losing that child? <laughs> Probably not. 
When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem to search for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. And all who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished, and his mother said to him, Child, why have you treated us like this? Like your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety. He said to them, Why were you searching for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he said to them. Then he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was obedient to them. His mother treasured all these things in her heart, and Jesus increased in wisdom and in years and in divine and human favor. Once they discover that he is not in the caravan with them on the way back home, they return to Jerusalem and they look for him. Has anyone in here been to Jerusalem? I haven't. Hmm. I guess we'll have to take a trip, JC. No one of you has been? From what I understand, Jerusalem is a massive place. Lots of Roman soldiers around in this time. Lots of people leaving from Passover. Lots of vendors. And so Mary and Joseph go back and they start looking in all the wrong places. Maybe he wandered off thinking that he wanted to see more of the city than just the temple. Maybe he found someone to stay with. Maybe someone else's mother said, we can't leave this child here by himself. We're not told all the places they look for him, but we're told that they search three days and they eventually find him in the temple. And that's probably the first place they should have searched, considering the temple is the central part of Jewish life. They find him sitting among the teachers and asking questions. Questions about history, life, tradition, law. And people are amazed at his understanding. And they know that most boys his age aren't this wise or knowing as Jesus is. Most are probably trying to get away from the temple and go out and play with their friends to get out of their instruction time to have a little fun. But Jesus, who has the city all to himself with no parents in sight, decides to sit in the temple. He has a thirst for more knowledge and understanding in his Jewishness. We're told that Mary and Joseph are astonished. But that astonishment wears off pretty quickly when Mary moms Jesus, apparently in front of everyone. Show of hands if you've ever been mommed by your mom in front of your friends. <coughs> Mary says to Jesus, Why have you treated us like this? Why have you worried us? You've caused us great stress. And she probably said it in that I want an answer right now, young man, kind of voice that we know our mothers are really good at. But Jesus, being Jesus, doesn't give the answer that she probably wants. Jesus, being Jesus, answers his own mother with questions. Why were you searching for me? Didn't you know I was in the temple? The Gospel of Luke lets us know from the onset, from his presentation in the temple at eight days old, and in this morning's scripture, how important the temple is for Jesus. We later go on to learn that no matter how far across the Jewish world that he walks, that he spreads the good news, that he heals people, and that he makes disciples, he always comes back to the temple. And when he's not in the temple, he literally carries it with him. Jesus goes home with Mary and Joseph, and we're told he grows in years and wisdom. And we can imagine that this temple incident at age 12 becomes something that the family laughs about for years to come. Remember that time we forgot Jesus in Jerusalem? Ha ha ha. We don't know what happened and how he stayed behind, but we can easily imagine that every year after that, when it was time to go home from Passover, 
Passover, Mary and Joseph knew exactly where Jesus was. <coughs> this narrative of the boy Jesus at the temple makes an impression on me. Partly because Jesus is just being what Jesus is, what we now know as a middle school boy. And that's a fun age. If you've never been in my Sunday school class, you'll learn. But the larger impression that this makes is that even though Mary and Joseph are given this child to raise, this child who is going to do great things, this child who we've been told is going to be the greatest one ever, they can see that he's special, but they can't quite wrap their minds around how special and even as special as Jesus is, Mary and Joseph, the Holy Mother and Father, lose him and have to search for him. With our ability to lose and search, we are all, Mary and Joseph, looking for Jesus after Passover. Searching for Jesus. Unlike Mary and Joseph, though, we don't have to physically search for the boy Jesus who is lost, the boy who we should be keeping safe and taking care of. That's not our role. That was their role. We haven't lost him in that way. We lose him in other ways, though. Like when we don't love our neighbors when we hate and discourage, when we harm others, when we prevent the freedoms of other human beings, when we don't take care of people, and I think of the community garden, when we lose our sense of discipleship because other things become more important. Money, fame, status, jobs, other things grab our focus. When we try to turn Jesus into what we want him to be, instead of what he has always been and what he will always be, the center of hope, the light of the world, the refuge for the wounded, sick, hurting, different, and scared. The center of hope the light of the world for all of us. Mary and Joseph eventually found Jesus in the temple, and we find Jesus here in the sanctuary amongst other believers. Sometimes, though, we stop searching outside these walls. We say Jesus is everywhere. What does that mean? <coughs> It's hard to believe that this is the last Sunday of 2018. But on this last Sunday of this year, I want us to pledge that in 2019, we will search for Jesus. We will search as individuals and as a congregation. We will seek him in the comfortable pews that are nicely padded, red. But we will also seek him outside where it's not so comfortable. His ministry teaches us that we often find him with those whom we would least expect, in those places we don't think to look, in those places that we're too scared to go, in those places that we don't want to go. We commit ourselves to searching for Jesus in this new year. What will we find? Who? will we find? How will our lives change as individuals and as a congregation? And how will we change the lives of others? That is your evangelical word on this last Sunday of the year. This ends this morning's word. Thanks be to God.